Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another American Jurisprudence read, and we're going to do deeds. So deeds are instruments conveying title to land. We're going to be reading from American Jurisprudence, second edition, and we're also going to have Black's Law Dictionary handy with us so that we're able to find any word that we don't know and make sure we leave no word behind. I'll zoom this in a little bit here. And we've got the Latin pronunciation guide here in case anyone has any confusion in the way they have the words phonetically spelt. And yes, we're using ninth edition. Let's see if that looks good in the screen there. It looks good uh, more that way, and that thing else should be just right. Okay. And we're going to be reading from American Jurisprudence on deeds. So let's get right to it here and make sure you hit that like button and let us proceed with deeds. So starting with the summary, the scope of this will be, ah, before we start, make sure you have your Esquire pencil ready. Because you will want to be taking notes on this. This gets to the heart of some of the 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 best benefits of being in the United States of America is our property rights. And deeds are a way of conveying rights to property through title. This being very different from other parts of the world where, and in parts of history, where a king would have the final say on who could stay on a piece of land. So let's continue from here. All right, okay, get this off the screen here. And off the screen. Jesus, hang on. Hmm. Hang on a second. We can get this off somehow. There we go. All right, now we're ready to go. So, the scope of this article will discuss deeds as instruments conveying title to land, including methods of conveyance, of conveyancing real property formal requisites as to content and wording, parties to the instrument, including competency, capacity, and designation, description of the property conveyed. By the way, convey means to transfer the property. Another word here, appurtenant in incidental property rights passing with the deed. Exceptions and reservations. Consideration, including presumptions, burden of proof, and parole evidence relating thereto. Execution, delivery, and acceptance. Validity in general, and as affected by fraud, duress, undue influence, or mistake. Construction or interpretation, including language describing the property and exceptions or reservations, and the operation and effect of a deed. It's a mouthful. We're not going to go from here. We need to figure out some of these words. I think we know convey <clears throat> means to move. Let's look it up in blacks anyways, just so we have a good foothold here. First of all, let's look at uh, one of these other words here, because it's not, it's one we find here, parole evidence. What's parole evidence relating there to of the burden of proof. So let's find out what they mean by a parole evidence. And let's do that in Black's Law. And let me interact with here. And Okay, here we go. Parole. From the 15th century, a noun. A parole or peril is an oral statement or declaration. Historical, the oral pleadings in a case. So it's an oral statement or a declaration. So what were we saying here? Uh, it was a parole evidence. This is different than the parole of 17th century, the conditional release of a prisoner, as you see here. Uh, let's see here. Parole evidence. No, I don't. Uh, there it is. Parole evidence. The evidence. So let's look at parole. So it seems to me that we don't need to look that up any further. 
we see that when the word parole is written with the word like this, we're talking about an oral statement or a declaration. So let's get back to where we were. And parole evidence relating there too. So when they're talking about parole evidence of this, we're talking about oral declarations. Burden of proof and parole evidence relating to burden of proof. So we're going to learn about actual, you know, the, the statement of evidence like that. To think that you would be able to use oral statements, oral pleadings, in order to make a deed valid. I don't know. We're going to find out. So let's look at a few of these other words here. Uh, we can look up conveyance for those that don't know, just to be uh, on the same page as far as the legal use of it in this context. Uh, shoot. Let's go look up this way. Uh, you got to wait for this stupid uh, search here because I don't have it. This is a scanned document and it's not uh, easy to search. Doesn't pull up the word on the first, it pulls up a lot with it. Convey, convey, oh, shit. Almost there, 411, there it is. So I'm searching it otherwise because it'd be faster than uh, through the live stream version. Oh, shoot. All right, come on. Here we go. And there it is. So there we go. Convey from the 14th century. Whew, that's old. To transfer or deliver something such as a right or property to another, especially by deed. So we're back to what we're learning about here, the deed. Or other writing, especially to perform an act that is intended to create one or more property interests regardless of whether the act is actually effective to create those interests. That's a lot to say there. Hey, we got Deanna in the house here. Welcome. And we got a wave here too. Everyone's giving a nice little wave. So we're all happy to be here to learn about deeds today because this is a good topic for everyone to learn. This involves property rights and transfer of property and titles and all this good stuff. So what we're looking at is a convey is a transfer or deliver something, right? So the word we were looking at was conveyance, the voluntary transfer of a right or of property. In this case, we're looking at the voluntary transfer of property. Voluntary is a key operating word here. So let's look at it this way is when we're seeing it in this t context here, we're talking about <clears throat> in a few different ways here, the conveyance. Uh, anyway, yep, okay. Uh, we're talking about the conveyance, conveyancing and conveying. So instruments conveying title to land, including methods of conveyancing real property. That's a strange word conveyancing and I wonder if there is a legal definition that'll give us a little more clarity on that conveyancing and there it is 17th century so a little bit more modern the act or business of drafting and preparing legal instruments especially those such as deeds or leases that transfer an interest in real property <clears throat> so here we go not a small task to figure out this word because we get this paragraph. Conveyancing is the art or science of preparing documents and investigating title in connection with the creation and assurance of interest in land. Despite its connection with the word conveyance, the term in practice is not limited to use in connection with the old system title, but is used without discrimination in the context of all types of title. 
and that's 1988. That's land law from Peter Butt. Conveyancing may be regarded as the application of the law of real property in practice. And that's from a manual of real property, and that's 1993. So, uh, Omnicolor Armour. Anyone happen to know how to speak with a mortgage company regarding a home in an unsettled estate where the representatives are in breach of duties? That's complicated. And I think the best thing to do when things are complicated like that is to start with the foundational things, is that what is really going to occur in something like this? But before I could say anything, I just wanted to see, uh, I'm trying to clear this thing out. There we go. Spike. Yeah, it surely is. So what I'm going to say is this, is that when you're dealing with things like this, uh, first to know is that this is strictly an educational entertainment uh, live stream here that we're just doing a read of American jurisprudence and, and doing a general review just for uh, appreciation of the American system of jurisprudence and, and merely for entertainment, not for any type of legal lawful advice. I have no legal lawful knowledge or expertise to deliver, nor do I recommend anything I'm saying here to do for anyone. Do not try this at home. That being said, um, when you're considering something like this, I find it best to start with the foundational requirements of where the law meets the legal parts here. So, you know, title, deeds, uh, mortgage, things like these all come into play. And by having this deep understanding, the deep foundational understanding, not just in the current context, but the historical context and the progression of knowledge and legal uh, maneuverings that have gotten to us the point where we are today, will give you a much better perspective and surely an advantage over any other counterparts you might be dealing with in those types of legal interactions uh, involving any kind of estate of property that would be conveyed by a deed. That being said, let's get back to this because we're at a foundational level of this right here. Now, I just learned something that I didn't even realize because I thought I understood conveyance well because look at all the different kind of conveyances there are, right? But conveyancing is different. Despite its connection with the word conveyance, the term in practice is not limited to use in connection with old system title, but is used without discrimination in the context of all types of title. So this is something where, like I said, this is more modern look at this stuff, but when they're saying conveyancing seems to have been a way of making it more convenient or more uh, clear, of course, 17th century, of moving title. And as this, we're looking at a period of time where we're kind of getting away from the, the royalty of the, of the king, the lord, having uh, full dominion over the land, that you never have a, a true loyal title to the land. The king always does. And this is a, an effort of Americans to get away from that system because most of our common law was inherited from the British system. But we've brought in a whole nother system here called the system of equity that wasn't really existent in British common law. It was handled by the, the court of chancery. So that was royal decree. You know, I mean, it was the king deciding essentially the cases. So how do we deal with things that don't involve contract disputes of money and property? It was something of equity, right? An injunction, someone to do something or to not do something. That came to the king to decide. But we don't have a king in this country, nor will we give anyone that kind of power to decide the lives of private people. That being said, the courts of equity following these kinds of principles here are what we have. And this actually kind of is interwoven within that court of equity concept. And it's not a separate building of court, just like you know, administrative courts aren't a separate building from the civil courts in a lot of places. But they are distinctly different in their rules of procedure and their rules of evidence and things like that. So uh, let's get back to this. Conveyancing. So is it the art or science of preparing documents and investigating title in connection? So two things, preparing documents, investigating title. You've heard of title searches, right? Conveyancing. They search the title and they prepare documents. In connection with a creation, so now we're creating a new document, and assurance, 
They're making sure, they're giving their assurance that what they're creating is valid, of interest in land. So it's an art when you're talking about an assurance, because how can you be, you know, science can only give you a degree, but something like this can be sometimes hard to quantify when you're talking about, I don't know, this is something where you say the art or science, depending on the application, it may or not be clear, the assurance of interest in land. You know, what if it was an old Indian burial ground? Was the title investigated well enough? Someone's going to come and get claim to that, that, that title now because it was invalid. And this conveyancing is the art and science of preparing documents and investigating the title in connection with the creation and assurance of interest in land. In land. So there we go. Conveyancing work to the bone, I think. We should be very clear on that. So back to American jurisprudence. This article will discuss deeds as instruments conveying title to land, simple conveying, as we saw before, the transfer, voluntary transfer, title to land. Let's get this right. Voluntary transfer, title to land, including methods of the art and science of preparing and researching those documents, right? Real property, land, formal requisites as to context, content, I'm sorry, and wording. Again, the art and science of preparing documents, conveyancing, parties to the instruments is what we're going to be discussing, including competency, compete, competency, capacity, compete. What are you competing? Well, who owns the title? Capacity and designation. Description of the property conveyed. So description this is what we're going to be going over. Oh, gosh. Appertinent. It's another word that I do not know. But we're going to find out what it means now. Shit. Can't remember how to spell it. Appertinent. Oh, okay. And appertinent. There we go. Six. Oops. There we go. Appertinent. Well, appertenance and appertenant. Annexed to a more important thing. But we have a nice explanation here. So what's appertenance, the noun from the 14th century? Something that belongs or is attached to something else. The garden is an appeturance to the land. There we go. Now I get a pretty good to understand. Uh, you guys can hear good, right? Clear, check, one, two. Okay. The word, oh gosh, appurtenance. The word appurtenances, which in former times at least was generally employed in deeds and leases, is derived from the word apprentier, which is Norman French and belong, means to belong to. Speaking broadly, the word means anything corporeal or incorporeal, which is an incident of and belongs to some other thing as principle. At a time when the construction of conveyances was of a more technical character than it is at present, the word was considered of much greater importance than it is now, and it was considered that in its absence from a lease or other conveyance, a very restricted meaning should attach to the words of the description of the premises conveyed. And that's from a, a treatise on the law of the landlord and tenant from 1909. Interesting stuff here. All right, great, loudly and clear. Excellent, thanks. Want to make sure? Okay, so here we go. So 
it's something that belongs to or is attached to something else. So we're saying an app, a, pert, a pertinence to the land. Annexed, attached to a more important thing, to a more important thing, part and pertinent. So there we go. A pertinent. A pertinence. Pertinent. Duh. Okay. So back to this. <laughs> we go back to American jurisprudence. So we're at a pertinent. Now I can say it, pr pr pronounce it properly. A pertinent, which is attached or annexed, and incidental property rights passing with the deed. Incidental could be, well, we could figure that out. That's probably open to interpretation. Exceptions and reservations. Consideration, including presumptions. Burden of proof. We're talking about deeds, right? Exceptions and reservations in the deeds. Considerations of the deeds, meaning is there some kind of consideration to have that deed? Including presumptions, burden of proof, and parole evidence relating thereto. So remember, this is the oral evidence. Execution, delivery, and acceptance of deeds. So we're going to explain how you can execute, deliver, and accept deeds. Validity in general, and as affected by fraud, duress, undue influence, or mistake. Now, this is a very important part here for deed. Because a lot of times, deeds can get transferred by fraud, or duress, or undue influence, or mistake. Construction or interpretation, including language describing the property and exceptions or reservations, and the operation and effect of a deed. So we're going to go over all this stuff within this ep this episode of run. Maybe not this entire episode, but within this journey on American jurisprudence of deeds. Now, treat elsewhere. We have a lot of other stuff here that we're not going to be looking at. Conveyance uh, and restrictions. See covenants, conditions, and restrictions. Deliveries of instruments and in escrow. Estates and land created by deeds. So there's going to be a lot of other stuff here. So the estates and land created by deeds is under estates, and I know. Um, You're talking about un, un, uh, unsettled estate. You can't read it on the screen here, but that's what it says. So perhaps we could find more answers in that one, too. And that's in the uh, estates. And that's in the first section here, estates in land created by deeds. So there's some other good stuff in that one. Gas and oil for deeds and conveyances related to, the, I guess, gas and oil, mineral rights, things like that. Mortgages and deeds of trust. Is that in the mortgages of American jurisprudence. Now, here's your minerals and deeds, conveyances and interests in, mines and minerals. Beautiful. There's so many great American jurisprudences. Uh, one of these days, I should probably just go through the uh, table of contents and do a poll and see who wants to, what, what gets the most votes and have a battle out and see, because there's some incredible stuff in these American jurisprudences. Public lands, adverse claims, quieting title. Now, how would like to go over this one, perhaps? If you guys think we should go over quieting titles? which is determination of adverse claims. That's abandoned property, things like that. If anyone would be interested in going over this one, I am, uh, and I'd be happy to. But i got to get feedback in the chat, maybe some ones in there, or a Q for quiet. No, Q will be the wrong thing. One will do fine. We get some ones in there. We'll come and do this another time. Anyhow, uh, registration of land titles. Imp important stuff here. Recording records and recording laws, which gets a little technical. It's not as fun to read on the live streams, but it's some good stuff. Vendor purchaser, water conveyances of, so water rights. I know there are some people that were interested in uh, private water wells and things like that. And there's a lot of interesting things here in American jurisprudence related strictly to that conveyances, right? The transfer. Transfer not just of the property, but the rights, the rights of water, right? All right, let's keep moving through here <clears throat> and let's get started. So, first section here. Deed. Section 1. A deed is a written, written document that, on its face, conveys title 
or an interest in real property. It is a written contract and subject to the parole evidence rule. And that's under, wow, 1985, Rad Spinner versus Charlesworth. Interesting. A deed is the final expression of the agreements between the parties as to every subject which it undertakes to deal with. And any conflicts between the terms of prior agreements and the terms of the deed are resolved by the deed. And that's, geez, Virginia, 2010. So we got to break this down because we're at the, you know, the initial one here. This is deed, section one, and we want to have a very clear idea of what we're talking about here. So it's a written document on its face, conveys, right? That's the voluntary transfer of title. Do we know what a title is? Let's find out exactly what they mean by title. So I learned a lot about just conveyance, and I think uh, title gives us a lot to learn from too. So let's find out where we get from title. Of course, this is going to be really hard to find here. See, let's start from the end, work our way back. Squatters' rights, 1855, though. <laughs> Adverse possession. This is great. So we could go over that. Like I said, there's a whole. I have a whole American jurisprudence on that. If people are interested in doing it, um, second here, almost there. Um, this looks like it. Sixteen fifty. Wow, there's a lot to search for to find it, I'll tell you that. All right, title. 15th century. The union of all elements as ownership, possession, and custody, constituting the legal right to control and dispose of property. So dispose of property. So sell it to transfer mineral rights. What's the... Anyways, uh, the legal link between a person who owns property and the property itself. No one. That's this is just a statement. Okay, ownership, possession, legal evidence of a person's ownership rights in property, an instrument, such as a deed, that constitutes such evidence. Record your title with the county clerk. So, those are just statements. So, the title is a union of all elements, ownership, possession, custody, constituting the legal right. So, person definition, yeah, but we'll get in the person varies depending on the context we're looking at. Have we come across person yet? Yeah, here we go. Legal link between a person who owns property. Right, but we're in this dictionary definition. We get into the American jurisprudence. When they say person, people, uh, individual, they all have different meanings, but within each context, it changes. Uh, people is about the only one that doesn't. So, uh, in this context, we're only going to see the Black's Law definition, but again, this is fluid. So let's just kind of keep it where they're talking about here. It could be a person, it could be a corporation, it could be, you know, a trust, whatever. So it's a legal link between a person who owns property and the property itself. So we'd also call this, I guess, a Lexus, the legal link, right? I think we're going to talk about it here, hopefully. Let's read this. Though employed in various ways, title is generally used to describe either the manner in which a right to real property is acquired or the right itself. In the first sense, it refers to the conditions necessary to acquire a valid claim to land. That's the first one. That's when it is generally used to describe the manner to which a real property is acquired. So in this case, a title, in this first case, it's the right is acquired. It's a transfer, right? You're acquiring it. 
So in the first sense, right, it refers to the conditions necessary to acquire a valid claim to land, which we're talking about the deed, right? In the second, it refers to the legal consequences of such conditions. Ah, these two senses are not only interrelated, but inseparable. What does that mean? Given the requisite conditions, the legal consequences or rights follow as, of course, given the rights, conditions necessary for the creation of those rights must have been satisfied. Thus, when the word title is used in one sense, the other sense is necessarily implied. What does that mean? That means that in this first sense, right, it's the conditions to acquire it. In the second manner of saying to describe title, it's talking about legal consequences of the conditions. If those conditions were not legally valid, right, one's not valid, then neither are valid. They are indispensable and inseparable of each other, of these two senses. So when you look at the word title, you have to look at it in two ways. The transfer was acquired. And the right of transfer was it valid. So was the was the transfer a valid transfer, and was the parties in transferring it itself valid? So it's again the right to the real property is acquired, or the right itself of the property to have made the transfer, right? First, the legal consequences in the second. Of such conditions. So what's the legal consequence? It's going to be the actual ownership. So that's where the title, see, it, it, one is separable from the other. And it really opens up a chicken and the egg thing. Where, who owns the title first? Who made the land? Where, who owned the very first title? See, it's not even matter who owned it first. All that matters in the eyes of the, of the legal system is, was the transfer to the current owner valid? And remember, it said here before in American jurisprudence, and I'm going to go right back to this statement because this is very important to understand, is that when you go into the, a deed, once the deed has become valid, that it resolves all the prior conflicts between the terms of prior agreements, right? And the terms of the deed are resolved by the deed. Do you get this? So a deed is the final expression of the agreements between parties as to every subject which it undertakes to deal with. And any conflicts between the terms of prior agreements and the terms of the deed are resolved by the deed. So deep concepts to look here, and you can't overlook any of these things. Again, we saw a long laundry list over here in the summary of things that could go wrong with a deed being invalid, right? We have things here. What were some of the things we saw? We saw for fraud, we saw duress, undue influence, mistake. It's a lot. A lot of things can be affected by fraud. The validity, remember we're talking about validity in general, can be affected by fraud, duress, undue influence, or mistake. So a deed that was done by mistake is not valid. Therefore, the transfer is not valid. That means that the title is not valid. Because a valid title has to be valid in both the transfer and the legal ownership. Let's continue. Let's read this one more time through now that we have a good, clear understanding of these terms. A deed is a written document that on its face conveys title, right? It's a voluntary transfer of the title or an interest in real property. It is a written contract. Now, contract, it's deep too, but we know it's a contract now, so it's going to have to fit the elements of a contract, a deed. It's not like a trust. Ah, you made it. Sorry to have it so late. Uh, you have rights, cops have duties. But we had to get it done. I had things to do too. I'm glad you made it, though. This will be worth it. Um, I'm going to do another one for you. I have one put aside for you when we can do it at decent hours, probably tomorrow. Uh, okay, so it is a written contract. So contract law comes into here. Uh, the elements of contracts, all these things. 
Oh man, sorry about to hear about the dog. Yeah, I mean, just as a little break here for memories, there was a uh, one of my very good friends when his dog uh, passed away. Uh, he was a you know a Labrador retriever, loved to swim. He was a, a swim dog, loved to be in the ocean, and we took him out into uh, his ashes out into uh, out into the Keys. And it was just such a beautiful uh, uh, ceremony there. And it's actually ended up being just a, a great day. I, I think just the whole thing of spread his ashes there in the, in the ocean and on the beach of a, a desolate key. It was beautiful. Yeah, so it's uh, it, it's really nice when, uh, you know, dogs are, are just as much family members as anyone else. So it's, uh, I understand what you're doing there and, and salute to you. All right, let's get back here. So, it's a written contract and subject to the parole evidence rule. As we spoke before, this is oral statements, oral declarations. So, a deed being an oral declaration brings here an interesting spin, and I'd really like to see how that, that rolls into it. All right. <clears throat> a deed is the final expression of the agreements between the parties as to every subject which it undertakes to deal with. In any conflict between the terms of prior agreements and the terms of the deed are resolved by the deed. So we've got that very clear. Let's move along here. Conveyance. Section 2. The term conveyance connotes a deed whereby the title to land is transferred from one person to another, again, person here, and that's under one, and we would look under this case, and, and oh, shoot. No, oh, stop. Wow, gosh. Uh, we don't want to go online to that. All right, hang on, I gotta fix this here real quick. Sorry, guys. Give me one moment here. Ah, a little quick, quickie on the clicky here. So and we're looking over deeds. Can't believe it makes me do all this. Okay. All right. And I got to do one more thing here. All right. Okie doke. Let us proceed. So, conveyance. Once more. <laughs> the term conveyance connotes a deed whereby the title to land is transferred from one person to another. And in this case right here, 1904, uh, we'll find uh, North Carolina, Van versus Edwards, Vaughn versus Edwards, whatever. And then we have another one, 1939 in Tennessee. So uh, that's where you're going to see where the person is defined here. And something tells me that McQuitty Printing Company is a person, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. So you'll probably find clear definitions in this context there. And that's why we get these footnotes, because what we're looking at are just general uh, summaries and, and definitions and overviews and, and some practice tips, uh, insights, observations. And American jurisprudence is more about understanding a fundamental, you know, the, or I should say the foundations of, of law so that you can practice it in a way that can adapt to whatever situation you're in, criminal, civil, uh, administrative, contract, uh, et cetera, et cetera, tort. So it covers the whole gamut of law and common law specifically, but our American style. So it's not strictly common law, but it has a very strong backbone of common law in it because common law very much used to be the strength of our nation. And now it's actually becoming its very weakness because of what I find to be uh, liberal judges ruling from the bench and and really uh, just destroying our, our common law principles. You see these old cases, even 
when you get beyond the 30s, you start to get a little suspicious in some of these cases as far as common law application. However, it is, uh, can't be discounted because the whole purpose of, of our law, system of law, is to be able to adapt it to the needs of life. So for a rigid system of laws would be tyranny, and we have to have a, a, a reasonable system to be able to make our laws adapt in a written way so that they're more indelible and not lost in, in liberal interpretations. All right, I digress, so let's get back on track here. The conveyance may include a lease. However, the passing of real property by intestacy has been held to not constitute a conveyance within the meaning of a real property statute. And that's number four. The state of Geyser is in uh, New York, 1977. Or is that... Uh, Sure, it is there. Yeah, it is. Okay, so we get another word here. Intestacy. So passing of property by intestacy. And we're going to look up intestacy. And no one's beat me to it yet. All right. Something tells me this is not, uh, oh, here we go. Jeez, oh, really? Laws of intestacy. There it is. I guess we got to look it up then. So here it is. It's uh, page 926. All right. Intestacy, the state or condition of a person's having died without a valid will. <laughs> that sucks. State or condition of a person's having died without a valid will. Strange. Uh, really put it, die without a valid will. Okay, so if you don't have a will when you die, you're intestine. Intestate. Intestable, not capable of being tested. That's a different word. Intested. And one has died without valid will. Partial. Okay. Intested law. The relevant statute governing succession to estates of those who die without a valid will. Someone was asking about something about uh, intestate law. Am I saying this right? Intestate, yeah. Uh, the relevant statute. So you look in your local statutes, your state. Governing succession of estates of those who die without a valid will. So there you go. Hopefully someone learned something from that. And there we go. Back to American jurisprudence. Um, no, not necessarily involuntary. Because if it's uh, it's just a state of dying without a valid will. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't some other way of uh, maybe you have nothing to transfer. Everything was in trust. I don't know. There could be a lot of, lot of reasons. Uh, but intestacy is it's not a common word in our vernacular for a reason. And I'm not sure what that reason is, but now we see it's being mentioned here with real property. So the passing of real property by intestacy has been held not to constitute a conveyance within the meaning of a real property statute. So without having a valid will, so by some other way, I get it. Grant, ah, is a synonym of conveyance. <whistles> Grant is a synonym of conveyance. That's endearing versus Brush Creek Coal Company in Tennessee, 1945. That's a little gem for you to jot down. Grant is a synonym of conveyance. So if you needed to move property through a grant, that'd be a charitable trust. Grants. So this is something to be looking into. You're going to get thrown little gems like this in American jurisprudence just sitting out by itself. And you're going to wonder why. Maybe. 
Maybe it is something special. Maybe they just had it separated. But I like to take note of these things. And when you see the word conveyance, you could substitute grant. It's a synonym. Not like. It's synonym. So, all right. Uh, let's proceed. That was brief, but very dense. Indenture. Deed pull. What's this? An indenture is a deed or writing containing a conveyance, bargain, contract, covenant, or agreement between two or more parties, which gets its name from its form of writing, which is counterpart with edges indented to facilitate identification of the parts. Thus, it is distinguishable from a deed pull, which is a deed executed by the grantor only, the usual form of commencement being, no, all men by these presents, or I hereby grant, etc. See, look at this. Isn't this beautiful? So if it's an indenture indeed, it'll be a commencement saying this, and right away you know it's an indenture from a deed pool. Now, what does that really mean? It's containing a conveyance bargain contract between two or more parties. Okay, and ah, conveyance, right, agreement between two or more. Hmm. Distinction between deeds, leases, or mortgages. Although leases are, in a sense, conveyances, the term deed is not ordinarily used to describe them. Hang on a second. I got to take a pause here and see what we get on the chat here. Uh, have you noticed that almost every state in the agency has a preamble that recognizes an almighty God? Hence, inherent rights to believe in inherent rights, legal, state, level. Uh, I saw you said something about this. You have rights. Cops have duties. And that's something uh, I'm glad you put that out there because I was trying to remember what you what it was because I try to keep juggle a lot of thoughts in my head. But that is something I, I got to read it again because it doesn't fit. Have you noticed that every state agency, right, has a preamble that recognizes an almighty God, hence inherent rights, to believe in inherent rights, legal, state, level. And yes, so again, it's um, not to believe in any particular God or religion, but the inherent rights themselves, right? It's an inherent right to believe in the inherent rights. I like that. Uh, excellent. All right, let's continue here. So property law regards a lease as equivalent to a sale of the premises for the term of the lease. The term deed is to be distinguished from a mortgage or a deed of trust, which does not really dispose of the title to the land, but merely provides security for a debt. And that's Mortgages in American Jurisprudence, Section 1. Let's read this again. The term deed is to be distinguished from a mortgage or a deed of trust, which does not really dispose of the title to the land, but merely provides security for a debt. Trick of words, a mortgage is a deed of trust. A deed of trust is not a deed. A bond for title does not operate as a conveyance of itself. Interesting there, too. So these are the cases to look up for that. 1910, this stuff's well established uh, as to whether leases may fall within a statutory definition of the term Conveyance, see section two. So uh, we, we already did. All right, so we're here to section five. 
distinction between deeds and wills. Right, so whether an instrument is a deed or a will depends primarily on its operation and not on its form or manner of execution. The essential characteristic of a testamentary instrument is that it operates only upon, by, and reason of the death of the maker. Prior to the date of the testor's death, a will is merely the expression of an intention to dispose of one's property in a certain way in the future provided one does not have a change of mind. Interesting there. In order that an instrument may be operative as a deed, it must pass a present interest, although it is not necessary that the grantee take a present estate in the property conveyed. Interesting here. You have to take a present estate in the property conveyed. Accordingly, where a provision in an instrument in the form of a deed, postponing its taking effect until after the death of its grantor, is construed as passing a present interest in the grantee, the instrument is a deed. In the absence of a statutory provision that the instrument will operate as a will. Okay, so remember the wills are always operating your state laws because they're going to execute that. Uh, so statutory provisions that says that a particular deed will operate as a will. Where, however, the provision in an instrument postponing its effect until after the death of the grantor is construed as passing an interest not to take effect until the death of the maker. The instrument is a testamentary notwithstanding that in form it may be a deed. Under such an instrument, the maker is not deprived of the right of revoking the instrument. It is revocable and ambulatory, and hence it is testamentary in character. Wills and deeds are distinguished by the power of revocation, residing in the maker in the case of a will, whereas a deed, once executed and delivered, is irrevocable. You get that? Deeds are like done and in the present in the absence of the reservation of the right to revoke. Well, conveyance is the, the transfer of a right or property, uh, land. So uh, I don't think it would be you traveling. Now, if you're moving a deed in your car, maybe. <laughs> All right, let's proceed. So lots of case laws. As to the construction of an instrument of a deed or will, Okay, so we can see sections that's uh, in here too, I believe. So lots of stuff here. Uh, old stuff, 45, 46, 66, 15, 1917, 1943. Newest one's this one, Texas here, in 1979. But even that dates back away. So we're on to purpose of deed, necessity. Okay, why do we have deeds? Why deeds we have titles? Well, the purpose of the deed is to pass title to land. Um, yeah, no deed to a car. Not as far as I've read here. There must be a written instrument. So the purpose of the deed is to pass title to land. The purpose, so <laughs> I don't see how a car could be a deed. Uh, deeded. A purpose of a deed is to pass title to land. There must be a written instrument. The appropriate method of making a voluntary transfer, a conveyance of real property as a conveyance in the lifetime of the grantor is by deed. Yeah, um, letters testamentary. Uh, yeah, so, all right, let's do this. What the heck? We're going to look up testamentary, and just so we have a clear understanding of what that means.
second. All right, hang on a second. Testamentary. Make sure I get the spelling right. Give me just a moment here. One more time here. I see. Testamentary. There we go. All right. Man, a lot of things here are testamentary. We can't even get to the T's. Testamentary. Here we go. Wow. Those are trusts. Jeez. Wow. Getting closer. Bottom here. Here we go. Finally, sixteen forty. And there, there we go. Okay. Testamentary. Oh boy. Down the rabbit hole we go. Testament is a, traditionally a will disposing of personal property. Testamentary. 14th century, of or relating to will or testament, testamentary, provided for or appointed by a will. Testamentary is provided for or appointed by a will, a testamentary guardian. Testamentary gift, created by a will. Testamentary gift. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, would you call it a letters testamentary? We have letters, disposition, gift, guardian, instrument. Let's see, letters, trust, trustee. Factio, test, test, testamenti factio is Latin, right to make a testament broadly the capacity to take part in a will as a testator, heir, or witness, the capacity to make a will. Okay, so yeah, a lot of testamentary stuff, testamentary capacity. We got it. Good diversions. So let's get back to where we were. So the purpose of the deed is to pass title to land. There must be a written instrument, the appropriate method of making a voluntary transfer of real property in the lifetime of the grantor is by deed. A deed is not, however, the only method of acquiring title to realty. Hmm. Title may also be acquired by operation of law, as where title is acquired by adverse possession or descent, or it may be acquired by will. So, what are four ways we can acquire property? By deed, adverse possession, descent, or will. Uh, you have rights, cops have duty. I was just asking before if we are going to have a poll if we wanted to do one on adverse possession. American jurisprudence, I could do an episode on that one too. Because I do have some, some good stuff on that. Um, it's interesting, but I don't want to be talking to myself on that. So if people are interested in adverse possession, stick a one in the chat at some point, and I'll take a tally. Okay, well, we could let people know how to do it, too, because there's a process, and we outline that all in American jurisprudence. So it's probably a good thing for people to know. All right, let's continue here. All right, do we miss anything here? Uh, description of property conveyed. Ah, to the description. That's 1982. Ooh, interesting stuff. And that's for the, the property. That's footnote two, written instrument. So how the property is, descri is described that's conveyed in that written instrument is critical. And you refer to this case to see the details, how that played out. Texas as a appellate court, Corpus Christi. 1982. Where's Odd said it was Corpus Crispy, right? I don't think they realized he was only joking. Takes 20 years in Illinois for adverse possession. Oh, well, 20 years, 20 years. I mean, you're waiting that whole 20 years. If you find something that's been uh, abandoned for some of that time, 
Interesting stuff. A lawful subject matter is required for a deed to be effective. That's what we're reading is what may be conveyed. Sorry, we're on section seven, what may be conveyed. A lawful subject matter is required for a deed to be effective. Any interest in realty, either legal or equitable, may be conveyed by deed, including a vested remainder. So, interesting there. One cannot convey an interest greater than one possesses in property, and a conveyance of property is invalid to the extent the seller tries to convey an interest greater than he or she has. One who does not hold title to property cannot pass or transfer title to that property. Hmm, that's six. Footnote six. Let's see here. Oops. Okay, see here. Footnote six. Home, home concepts. Wow. And that was, what year is that? 2010, 2012, 2010. So, wow, that's some new stuff here. One who does not hold title to property cannot pass or transfer title to that property. Huh. I would figure as much, right? Minerals, ooh, including oil and gas, are usually regarded as being part of the realty, conveyable as such. Timber trees may be transferred by deed, grant, or reservation as an estate separate from the land itself. So you could create an estate of your trees and then probably have them harvested by a lumber yard, do the uh, a lumber lease, or transfer by deed. An annuity may be created by the deed. So guys, have if you have any lumber land... This is an interesting concept. A title which has been gained by prescription may be conveyed and transferred by deed. That's number 10. And that's as to the distinction between prescription and adverse possession. Again, I had this one. We could go over adverse possession, but I haven't. I see one in there. Is that uh, uh, Leo Aguilar? Is that one for adverse possession? Uh, let's see, where is it here? Someone typed it in. There it is. Yeah, put it in a one in the chat if we want to do an American jurisprudence on adverse possession at some point. Soon. I'm just kind of curious if it's uh, an interesting topic for for everyone. Yes. Yeah, we got that one. Yes. I know if uh, anyone... I, I know you have rights, cops have duty. You're familiar with it. So you probably... Uh, are you live? Yes, I am, uh, Deborah. We are live right now. Live as it gets. There we go. Yes, we're live. You're on with the other profile today. Okay, cool. Hope you subscribed with this one, too. That we'll get the notification no matter what. All right. Yes, 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 yes. All right, cool. You, you want to? All right. Adverse possession is very interesting, and I think it's something that... uh. Oh, if you're ignorant to it, yes. That's that's a great uh, attitude. Excellent. Okay, so then that's adverse possession. Cool. I was kind of wondering if it would be a little bit too off. Uh, you can't rewind to the beginning. you got to just wait. That's why it's, it's like a class. you got to come on time. You know, you don't tell the teacher to start from the beginning. It doesn't work like that on YouTube either for some reason on my channel. It's just the way YouTube wants it. I don't know why. Uh, okay, here we go. Let's get back to where we were. So a tile which has been gained by prescription may be conveyed or transferred by deed. So let's look at this cumulative supplement here. Cases. A grantor cannot convey what the grantor does not own. Oh, shoot. Look at this. And this is recent. Nation Star Mortgage LLC versus Goodman. New York's fourth. Oh, my gosh. 2020. So a grantor cannot convey what the grantor does not own. I uh, this I recommend everyone look up this case right here, this Nation Star Mortgage LLC versus Goodman. I've heard of this somewhere. I'm trying to remember the details of this case, but it's probably worth looking up. Uh, 2020 case in New York. Adverse 
as the assignability of property rights, as to an heir's assignment of his or her prospective inheritance, as to deeds transferring a vested interest acquired by interstate succession. Distribution. All right, let's see. Uh, Okay, so we get a lot of good stuff here. Gas and oil, logs and timber. Oh, so we got American jurisprudence on all these. I tell you, the, the table of contents is mind-blowing. So we get, I mean, this is like, almost like a life study that we could do here. And easily, I think everyone should be doing this because at some point we should have the ability to be our own law practitioner for things like this. Um, I could understand there's some aspects where you do need to have some professional counsel on a lot of things. And I have absolutely no legal expertise, knowledge, lawful or otherwise, and I'm not here to give advice, nor am I able to give advice, nor should anyone take any advice I'm giving here. This is all just uh, for entertainment purposes and educational, and it's an exploration into American jurisprudence, and do not try any of this at home. Let's continue. Property right in title deeds. Hmm. We've got some other good stuff to... Okay. A deed... A title deed is subject to conversion and is recoverable by the person who is entitled to hold it by the usual actions available for the recovery of personal property. Real estate is not, however, subject to conversion. Now that is interesting. A title deed is subject to conversion and is recoverable by the person, but the real estate is not subject to conversion. Whatever that means, that's under conversion. So that only behooves us to go to our friend Black and let's look up uh, what they call conversion. Okay, give me a moment here as I'm looking through here. Consent. Conversion. Come on, there it is. Finally. Or owner. All right. Conversion, where did it go? Conversion, the act of changing from one form to another. The process of being exchanged. So let's break this down. Equitable conversion, a change in the nature of property so that real property is treated as personal property or vice versa, in certain circumstances. Ooh, that's interesting. Equitable conversion is based on the maxim that equity regards as done that which ought to be done. Equity regards as done that which ought to be done. The most common situation involves transferring real property as the parties to a contract intended before the seller experience a chance in circumstances such as marriage or death, that could affect the property's ownership. When a contract is made, the buyer acquires equitable title to the property and the seller retains legal title. But the seller's interest is treated as one in personal property rather than in real property because the seller's true interest is in the proceeds, usually the personal property, such as cash. The legal title is security for the buyer's payment. Courts usually apply the doctrine of equitable, trans, equitable conversion to recognize the transfer of equitable title, including the right of possession to the buyer when the contract was signed. The buyer then acquires legal title by performing under contract. So that's a pretty... Uh, yeah, so the title or deed are two different things. Now the deed is is just your is the transfer of that title, and the title is going to be the right both in the how it was acquired, and the legal right to have acquired it in that way. 
of the property. It's the legal nexus between the property and the and the I guess the title itself is the written instrument, so that the law has a connection to the people that have the, or I should say, the person that has claim to the ownership of the property. The title would be the nexus between that and the property itself. So the conversion of a conver of a convertible security that's a forced conversion after a call for redemption, when the value of that security it may be converted to is greater than the amount will be received if the holder permits the security to be redeemed. Wow, tort and criminal law, the wrongful possession and disposition of another's property as if it were one's own. A uh, lot of stuff here. A lot of uh, distinct measures, methods by which one man may deprive another of his property. See, they say one man of his property. And so be guilty of conversion and liable in an action for Trover by wrongly taking it over, by wrongly detaining it, and by wrongly disposing of it. The term conversion was originally limited to the third of these cases. To convert goods meant to dispose of them, to make away with them, to deal with them in such a way that neither owner nor wrongdoer had any further possession of them. For example, by consuming them, by destroying them, by selling them, or otherwise delivering them to some third person. Merely to take another's goods, however, wrongfully, was not to convert them. Merely to detain them in defiance of the owner's title was not to convert them. The fact that the conversion in its modern sense includes instances of all three modes in which a man may be wrongfully deprived of his goods and not of one mode only is the outcome of a process of historical development whereby by means of legal fictions and other devices, the actions of Trover was enabled to extend its limits and appropriate to the territories that rightly belonged to other and earlier forms of action. So by conversion of good is meant any act in relation to goods, which amounts to an exercise of dominion over them. Any act, right, is an exercise of dominion over them. Inconsistent with the owner's right of property, it does not include mere acts of damage or even an asportation, which does not amount to a denial of the owner's right of property, but it does include such acts as taking possession, as conversion, refusing to give up on demand, disposing of the goods to a third person, or destroying them. So that's some pretty heavy stuff here. Uh, yeah, squatter's rights is a whole nother, uh, aspect too. And that comes to adverse possession though. I mean, it's just one, uh, subset there, but again, squatter's rights, like you said, it's part of a, a misnomer or a, uh, you know, it's, it's been a, a, uh, a pejorative, I should say, of adverse possession. Okay. So we did a pretty good deep dive into conversion. I hope everyone got something out of this because it continues to go on. Fraudulent conversion. This is the last one we're going to go over. Conversion that is committed by the use of fraud, either in obtaining the property or in withholding it. Trover. We got to look up what Trover means because I don't know what it means. If someone wants to put it in the chat and save us the trouble, that'd be great. Otherwise, I'm looking it up right now. And here for these stupid T's. Jeez. Trover. No one knows Trover. Huh? Here we go. Okay. 1675. All right. Trover. A common law action for the recovery of damages for the conversion of personal property, the damage is generally being measured by the property's value, also termed trover and conversion. Hmm. All right, let's listen to this one. I'm glad we stopped for this. Trover may be maintained for all kinds of personal property, including legal documents, but not where articles are served or severed from land by an adverse possessor. Mm, see this? So Trover 
That's a common law action for recovery of damages. It is uh, maintained for all kinds of personal property, including legal documents, but not where articles are severed from land by adverse possessor, <laughs> at least until recovery of possession of the land. So they can't use Trover to recover damages from the squatter. <laughs> it lies for the misappropriation of specific money, but not for breach of an obligation to pay where there's no duty to return specific money. Ah, this is it lies for the misappropriation of specific money. Interesting stuff, though, huh? Okay, let's get back to where we were here. So, what law governs? Section 9. From the standpoint of time, the law in effect at the time of the execution of the deed governs its validity and interpretation. Matters pertaining to the validity of conveyances of real property are governed by the law of the citus of the property. What's a citus? Do you know what a citus is? Now, this is going to be a fun one. Let's look up citus. Sounds Greek. Uh, let's cite. Hang on. Citus, citus, citus. Gosh. It's not going to give us this, is it? Uh, hang on. Can't believe it's going to do that, really. Oh, there we go. Okay. I found it, anyways. Search didn't help me on that one. Oh, shoot. No, I'll tell you something, is it? No. About oh, 15. There we go. Okay. Almost there, Citus. There it is. Okay, Citus, Latin, 1834. Location or position of something for legal purposes, as in Lex Citus. The law of Citus. They said Citus. Okay, Citus. Like a site. Citus. Location or position of something for legal purposes, as in Lex Citus. The law of the place where the thing in issue is situated. See, locus. Tax situs, C tax situs. Yeah, so this is an important one here to know is situs as far as taxes go. It's a location for legal purposes. All right. Let's proceed. So matters pertaining to the validity of conveyances of real property are governing governed by the law of the situs of the property. And that's number two. Uh, it's Chevy Chase Land Company of Montgomery County, Maryland versus U.S. And that's uh, 1997. Wow. So pretty uh, new stuff. Yeah, see tax situs. Hey, delete laws. Good to see you. Uh, I'd like to, but we're going to get lost in the tax world on that. But we could do a whole other one on the taxes because I have the uh, I have that Amjur too. When we get into tax situs, and then that's uh, we got some pretty interesting stuff on that. But that's a rabbit hole in and of itself. Uh, I want to focus here on the deeds because we're talking about just the uh, – the, uh, let's see. Do we miss any of these case laws here? Yeah, okay. As the time which the grantor's capacity to execute a deed is determined. So as the time which a deed becomes operative, including the question whether it relates back. So again, it seems like the holdings here are from the standpoint of time, the law in effect at the time of execution of the deed governs its validity and interpretation. So that's 2001. So this has been reaffirmed recently, but dates back. Okay. Either way, it's pretty well established, I would say, here. And matters pertaining to the validity of conveyances of real property are governed by the law of the situs of the property, and that will be by the state herein. All right, let's proceed. And we're on to quit claim. 
quit claim deeds. We've heard of these before, right? And of course, we have the forms and everything with American jurisprudence, which is another beautiful thing. Okay, so let's get to it. Quit claim deeds are commonly used to convey interest of an unknown extent or claims having a dubious basis. To the extent the grantor holds good title to the property, for purposes of conveying title, a quick claim deed is as effective as any other deed. Look at this. So, quick claim deeds are commonly used to convey interest of an unknown extent or claims having a dubious basis. That's interesting. To the extent the grantor holds good title, so the conveyance is of unknown extent. The interest of the conveyance in having a dubious basis. So pretty strange uh, wording here. That's geodyne energy income production versus, wow, that's some recent stuff in Texas, 2005. So that's the case there. We'll get a little more clarity on that from that text. To the extent the grantor holds good title to the property. And that's on footnote two, which is Bradford versus Brady, Alabama, 2011. Okay, uh, let's see, but the holding for that applies to this here. Let's see, for purposes of conveying title, a quick claim deed is as effective as any other deed for the purposes of conveying title. So focus on that. Only for the purposes, it's as effective as any other deed. A quick claim deed is intended to pass any title, interest, or claim which the grantor may have in the premises but not professing that such title is valid. In fact, a quick claim deed does not import that the grantor has any interest at all. Hmm. It conveys nothing more than what the grantor owns. It's not about their interest, but what they own. So an essential characteristic, here we go, of a quick claim deed is that it contains no warranties or covenants by the grantor. So, again, unknown extent, right? It's convey interest of an unknown extent. So there can be, I guess, no warranties or covenants by the grantor. Interesting stuff. A quick claim deed expresses upon its face doubts about the grantor's interest. And any buyer is necessarily put on inquiry as to those doubts. Thus, ordinarily, a quick claim deed Without warranty of title, cannot be a warranty or misrepresentation of title. Ha <laughs> ha. The operative words of a quit claim deed are conveys and quit claims. And that's section. That's footnote nine, and we're gonna look this up here. Quit claims. I think this might have some some more meaning for us here because that's as one word. Do we have a definition? No, I don't see it as such. Try this one more time here. That's two words. Mm. Okay, so. Yeah, quick claims. Um, I'm trying to find it here. So we get a lot of. Yeah, just bear with me for a second here. I got to search this a little bit separate from the uh, other one here. Jeez. Ah, uh, jeez. No, I don't think it has quick claim as such, but let's see what we got here. we we'll find something under quit. We could learn under claims, perhaps. Man. Uh, damn, I don't have enough headings on this thing either. It makes it really hard to find. Bear with me, guys. It's a lot of uh, moving through here. Cute. I should be close to it here. Wow. This is totally not coming up my search. Oh, here we go. I found where... Okay, so this is close enough. Okay. 13.96. And here we go. Quick claim. 14th century, oh, get back here. 14th century, to relinquish or release a claim or right, to convey 
right? That's that's a voluntary transfer. All of one's interest in property, to whatever extent one has an interest, to execute a quick claim deed. So, to relinquish or release all of one's interest, so we don't even know the interest, to whatever extent one has an, in an interest. <laughs> That's interesting there. Uh, hey, thank you there. Delete laws. Yeah, we're just uh, trying to do a, a, a long-form session here late at night, so we can kind of keep it in a long-form stretch here. But I try to go over the process of going through these legal, uh, or I say these law, uh, law documents. This is American jurisprudence. And there's a process to do it, which is a lot of looking up these words and their operating definitions within this context of the law, because the meanings here are very rigid when they're used in their particular subject matter. And it is a laborious thing to do, but it's essential. And once you get used to doing it, it's fun because you learn a lot of things along the way, as I'm constantly learning as we're doing this. So now we learned something about the quit claim, that the interest is all of them to whatever extent you have an interest, meaning even if you have none. So let's get back here to uh, on there properly. Yes. So. So we had as interest conveyed by the quick claim deed, see the case section 277, and so you deny that it's nothing there. Just see if they have any notes. Sometimes they have notes next to these cases. Otherwise, you can look under here. Here's a six, this is in Florida, 2011, in first district, Lane versus Lane, Wells Fargo. So these are some interesting cases here in Florida. Number six, what was this referring to? It conveys nothing more than what the grantor owns. Okay, good. Interesting stuff. Let's move along. And we're on to confirmation deed, section 11. The purpose of a correction deed. Okay, confirmation. <laughs> the purpose of a correction deed is to admit mutual error. Did I miss something here? Confirmation deed. But they call this here, okay, confirmation deed is correction of mistakes in prior deed. So the purpose of a correction deed is to admit mutual error and change the original instrument to conform to the true intent. Very important when we're looking at the law, the intent of the parties. So we want to make sure that this original instrument conforms to the true intent of the parties. A mistake in the omission of parties may be corrected by a deed of correction to effectuate the intention of the parties. Straightforward, 71, 56. Yes, exactly. So yeah, confirmation deed, correction deed. All right, so now we're on to section 12, generally. Let's see where we're on now. Okay, so back to generally with deeds. If a grantor, one that has the, uh, the property and a grantee, can be determined from the whole of the instrument, and the document is signed and acknowledged by the grantor, then the document accomplishes a legally effective conveyance. Bam. So, grantor can be determined. Document is signed and acknowledged by the grantor. Done. Document accomplishes a legally effective conveyance. You've transferred. A deed must be drawn in such language as to indicate who is granting the property, to whom it is granted, and what the property is. Those are three elements, and it is usually for the conveyancer to set forth what the deed is intended to express in some formal manner. Title to real estate may be conveyed in a trust instrument, and the fact that the instrument is not captioned deed does not deprive it of legal effect as a conveyance of real estate provided it is otherwise valid as such a conveyance. So this is a great, uh, a great thing to look at. 
if you consider the title to real estate may be conveyed in a trust instrument, and the fact that the instrument is not captioned deed does not deprive it of the legal effect, as which a deed is a conveyance of real estate provided it is otherwise valid as such a conveyance. So as long as the trust instrument is valid for conveyance, for the voluntary transfer of the property, then it doesn't have to even be captioned deed to function as a deed, have the effect of the deed. It is not essential to the validity of an instrument as a deed to make it operative to pass title to land, that it follow any exact or prescribed form of words provided the intention to convey is expressed. Again, we're always looking at the intent. Law is focused on intention. And how can we codify this? Formality and exactness are not required. Get that? Formality and exactness are not required. Now, formality is nice, but it's kind of a... Uh... Yeah. Yes, that's it. It's uh, That's all it takes. It takes seems it takes one signature from the grantor, really, and a, an acknowledgement of that signature and the property described, and both parties uh, described. Think it all, the whole of that document, that instrument. Right, it can determine all of those elements. It will effectively be a conveyance of property, which would be a deed. Real estate, I should say. Okay, so again, the exactness are not required, but you know, they always like it. If you can have it formalized in some way that makes it uh, more standard that people recognize, it'll be easier to enforce. It is sufficient if the matter written is set forth in an orderly manner by words which clearly specify the agreement and meaning of the parties that bind them. The meaning. See, the meaning has to be in there too. I think we went over that with trust. A deed may refer to another deed for its terms. Ah, so you can reference other deeds and save yourself language. That's footnote 8. As a description of property, oh, by reference to another instrument. Okay, there you go. Interesting thing to know. As to, de de as to the description of property, remember it has to be described as an element of the deed. And if you could describe it by reference to another instrument, probably by county records and such is what they mean here, is what I would guess. But I don't know, because this is 1917. <laughs> Barry versus Marion County Lumber Company, so South Carolina. All right, so interesting stuff here that, that we're coming across here. So, again, a, a deed may refer to another deed for its terms. So that's something to, to look at, that other deed. So it had to be another legal deed. It couldn't be something other than another deed for the terms. Okay, so I think I got that down. And I hope everyone else does too. And let's proceed. Words of a grant. In order to transfer title, an instrument must contain apt words of a grant, which manifest the grantor's intent to make a present conveyance of the land by the deed, as distinguished from an intention to convey it at some future time, which would be more like a will, right? The granting clause of a deed determines the interest conveyed in some jurisdictions. So the granting clause, you get that? Big element, granting clause. It determines the interest conveyed in some jurisdictions which employ both a granting clause and a habendum clause. The granting clause is said to actively transfer the land from the grantor to the grantees, while the Habendum Clause describes the type of title that has been granted. Rights and property of varying degrees may be created within a grant. Habendum. Habendum. Okay, Habendum. Jeez. Habendum Clause, I keep coming across that. Where is it? Here we go. Page 806. 
So here it is. Abendum, where to go? Abendum clause. Well, close enough. Abendum. 1829. The part. Wait a second. I just want to show here. Oh, I see what's the words there. All right, so habendum clause, the part of an instrument such as a deed, which we're talking about, or will, that defines the extent of the interest being granted and any conditions affecting the grant. The introductory words to the clause are ordinarily to have and to hold. <laughs> wow, also termed to have and to hold clause. So the provision in an oil and gas lease defining how long, oh boy, the interest granted to the lease will extend. Modern oil, so that's the habendum, habendum clause, right? Uh, it's secondary term. So the part of the deed was originally used to determine the interest granted or to lessen, enlarge, explain, or qualify the price. cannot perform the office of divesting the estate already vested by the deed. For it is void if it is to be repugnant to the estate granted. It has degenerated into a mere useless form, and the premises now contain the specification of the estate granted, and the deed becomes effectual without any habendum. However, the premises should be merely descriptive, and no estate mentioned. Then the habendum becomes efficient to declare the intention. Okay, and it will rebut any implication arising from the silence of the premises. You get that? So this is something that will help a rebuttal coming later from any implications arising from the silence of the premises. So having, it's just descriptive, but it still will help shield you from any other implications arising later, challenging the validity, it looks like here. So let's get back to where we were. Always a fun diversion like that. So rights, uh, Let's look back here. In some jurisdictions which employ both granting clause and a habendum clause, the granting clause is said to actively transfer the property from grantor to grantee. So we get that. While the habendum clause describes the type of title that has been granted. Hmm. So how is it that it gets the title that has been granted? It's the extent of the interest is granted, right? In the conditions. So I guess that's how. It's the habendum clause is the conditions that the type of the title has been granted. So rights and property of varying degrees may be created within the same grant. The absence of the words of conveyance cannot be supplied. And if no words importing a grant can be found in the deed, it is void. Although in other respects, formal and regular. Interesting stuff here, huh? The absence of words of conveyance cannot be it, it. The absence of the words of conveyance cannot be supplied, and if no words importing a grant can be found in the deed, it is void. Although in other respects formal and regular, so intent again. However, no particular verbal formula is required to affect a present conveyance. Nor is it essential that technical terms be used, so no legalese, as they would say, is necessary. If an intention to pass the title is disclosed, the court will give effect to such intention, notwithstanding an inaccuracy of ex expression or an aptness of the words used. Get that? If an intention to pass a title is disclosed, the court will give effect to such intention notwithstanding an inaccuracy of expression or inaptness of the words used. Conversely, the presence of technical words of conveyance does not necessarily constitute an instrument, a deed, if it was not the intention of the parties that it operate as such. So again, the words really don't matter as much as the intention. As long as the intention is clear, the words are your choice. They don't have to be technical, formal, no standardized. But they have to be clear. It has to be disclosed. It has to be, uh, you know, accurate. And it has to be apt. 
Other than that, the technical words themselves do not necessarily constitute an instrument of a deed. So intention, but clearly, effectively communicated that intention, not in any particular way, but in a clear way. Okay? So, yeah. Yeah, let's do it in a trust. <laughs> do it through trust. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, yeah, beautiful stuff here that, that really gets to be the thing that when you look at it this way, the intention to pass titles disclose a court will give effect to such intention, notwithstanding the inaccuracy of expression or the inaptness of words. And then conversely, the presence of technical words, so the shifty esquires are not going to get a deed pushed through if it wasn't the intention of the parties that it operate as such. And here we got our references here. That was 13, the last one. State of Chips, that looks good. Kip versus State of Chips, 1999, Vermont. And this one here is as to the connection, construction of a deed to determine the interest conveyed in C sections here. Okay, good. Yeah, the rest here, just cases to look at. This is City of Newcastle, Pennsylvania, 1911. Some, some pretty good cases here. And it's interesting, sometimes you'll see cases that, that look familiar, and they are, because they'll recur through these. Time and time again, some very well held uh, holdings here. All right, words of grant, words of inheritance. Big distinction here. Under common law principles, when the word heirs has been omitted from a deed, the grantee receives only a life interest, even though the deed expresses an intention to convey an interest of perpetual duration. Although words of inheritance, such as to the grantee and his heirs and assigns forever are no longer necessary in most states to pass a fee simple title. The use of such words strengthens the reading of a deed to pass a fee simple title and not some amalgam of lesser estates. So fee simple title. What is a fee simple title? I wonder. We have to look that one up. Fee simple title. Let's hope it's all right. We got some results. Of course, going to be tons of them. All right. Oh, I can't believe I picked the right one. All right. Okay. So here we go. It was down here, I think. Fee simple. There it is. 15th century. An interest in land that, being the broadest property interest allowed by law, endures until the current holder dies without heirs. Especially a fee simple absolute. Now, this is an important term to remember, guys. When you have property owned, I hear a lot of people talk about things like a lodial title and such, but that's sometimes harder to enforce or get other people to go along with as far as in in a court fee simple or fee simple absolute is another way of having absolute ownership in in, in title and property let's look at this here because this actually gets very deep and it's a good diversion for us right now so let's read this one more time An interest in land that being the broadest property interest allowed by law endures until the current holder dies without heirs, especially a fee simple absolute, often shortened to fee, also termed estate in fee simple, tenancy in fee, fee simple title, exclusive ownership, feudum simplex, and his heirs or whatever. Okay, so let's get to this now. Oh boy. Back to Peter Butt and the law. Fee simple is a term not likely to be found in modern conversation between laymen who would fall in all probability, find it quite unintelligible. Yes. Yet to a layman of the 14th century, the term would have been perfectly intelligible, for it refers to the elementary social relationship of feudalism with which he was fully familiar. The words fee and feudal 
are closely related. Ah, the estate in fee simple is the largest estate known to the law. The ownership of such an estate being the nearest approach to ownership of the land itself, which is consonant with the feudal principle of tenure. It is the most comprehensive estate in land which the law recognizes. It is the most extensive in quantum, that's your measurable quantity, measure, so you can measure degree and balance out uh, if you have more weight of, of a case than the other side, right? It's the most extensive in quantum and the most absolute in respect to the rights which it confers all of all estates known to the law. So there you go, fee simple. Boy, traditionally, the fee simple has two distinguishing features. First, the owner, tenant, in fee simple. So look, tenant in fee simple. A tenant is the owner. Has the power to dispose of the fee simple, either inter vivos, that's between living people, or by will, and the dead. Second, on intestacy, the fee simple descends in the absence of lineal heirs to collateral heirs. Remember what intestacy is. You don't have a will. You died without a valid will. The fee simple descends in the absence of lineal heirs to collateral heirs. Do you see this? Wow, Deborah, how'd you get your thing to show up in yellow? That was cool. For some reason, you're uh, you're up there. There we go. It was showing up uh, highlighted already. If we were required to pay taxes, how are we the owner? Well, that's uh, delete laws was kind of getting into that. Um, that's another amateur we have to do. Oh, when you asked that, I think my stream buffered. Uh, Deborah, I get to keep that one off the screen. We're going to do another one on this here. Let me put it back up in case it, it buffered. Uh, yeah, this is a whole nother case here when we get into fee simple, uh, the situs, and the nexus. I mean, uh, the lexus. I'm sorry, the, ne <laughs> the nexus. The nexus of uh, where the law and the situs and your property and all that meets and how you can tax and where the taxes are assessed from and how they can assess. So that's going to be a whole other one we can get into. But let's continue on this because this is some real interesting stuff here. So if you understand this about fee simple, that the first, the owner, the tenant in fee simple has a power to dispose of the fee simple, either inter vivos in life or by will. Second, on intestacy, right? You don't have a will. The fee simple descends in the absence of lineal heirs to collateral heirs to a brother, for example, if there is no issue. So literally that stays in the family. And the fee simple transfers. Wow. So fee simple originally. Originally, this was an estate which endured for as long as the original tenant or any of his heirs survived. Heirs comprised any blood relations, although originally ancestors were excluded. So it had to be your younger uh, blood relations. Not until the Inheritance Act 1833 could a person be the heir of one of his descendants. Ah, thus, as a first, uh, oh, sorry, thus at first, a fee simple would terminate if the original tenant died without leaving any descendants or collateral blood relations, brothers or cousins, even if before his death, the land had been conveyed to another tenant who was still alive. So if there's two tenants and only one has a fee simple, if he dies and that other tenant's not a blood relative, then tough luck. But by 1306, it, oh, geez, it was settled that where a tenant in fee simple alienated the land, the fee simple would continue as long as there were heirs of the new tenant and so on, irrespective of any failure of the original tenant's heirs. Failure, okay. Thenceforth, a fee simple was virtually eternal. 1993, that's a manual of real property. So fee simple absolute is in a state of indefinite or potentially infinite duration. 
to Albert and his heirs, often shortened to Fee Simple or Fee. Also team termed Fee Simple, absolute in possession. Although it's probably good practice to use the word absolute whenever one is referring to an estate in Fee Simple that is free of special limitation. Conditions, subsequent, or executory limitation. Lawyers frequently refer to such an estate as a fee simple, or even as a fee. So, that's a preface to estates and land and future interests, and that's 1984. Then you have fee simple conditional, fee, so all these different ones here. Different kinds of them. Boy, it should be easy to determine whether it is to the fee simple determinal. Okay, we're not going to get lost any further in this rabbit hole. Fee simple is the best title you can have. So let's look here. Under common law principles, when the word heirs has been omitted from a deed, the grantee receives only a life interest, even though the deed expresses an intention to convey an interest of perpetual duration. Although the words of inheritance, such as to the grantee and his heirs and signs forever, are no longer necessary in most states to pass a fee simple title. Uh huh. The use of such words strengthens the reading of a deed to pass a fee simple title and is not some amalgam of lesser estates. So it's a recommendation to add that language in there because its use of such words strengthens the reading of a deed to pass a fee simple title. That's it. This is the beauty of American jurisprudence is because you learn the why of what you put into these documents. So you're not taking a cookbook cookie cutter approach but you're literally understanding the law from the fundamental way. You're looking at it from a multifaceted uh, approach that will avoid pitfalls and, and unexpected rebuttals to your premises. Let's continue. Just have some case laws here, pretty recent in the 90s and one from 81. Words of grant, quit claim deeds. Okay, the words remise, release, and quit claim, which are the customary operative words of quit claim deeds, manifest the intention of the grantor to convey, right, that's a voluntary transfer, his or her present interest, whatever it may be, to the grantee. So all of whatever his interest is, and it's not defined, restricted, or restricted by conditions, to the grantee. Indeed, the words remise, release, and quit claim have been held to be synonymous, so that it would seem that one or more of these words would be effective. However, it should be noted that the use of the word quit claim does not conclusively establish that the instrument is a quit claim deed. Again, we're back to intent and wording. The words don't matter too, too much, but they can help. So again, formality, uh, proper terminology can be a benefit to the reading of it and the application of the law to your deed. However, it's not a requisite component or element of the deed to be valid. All right. Let's continue here a little bit more. We're coming up to the two-hour mark, so we're going to – this is a habend habendum. It's a good place. I think this might be where we break off for the next, uh, we'll do another chapter on this. I mean, another uh, session on this part. Okay, so informal deeds, formal deeds now, right? These are ones that are following a particular form and language. The habendum is that part of the deed, usually following the premises, which sets forth the estate to be held and enjoyed by the grantee. The purpose of the habendum clause of a deed is to curtail, limit, or qualify the estate conveyed in the granting clause or the premises. The habendum is no longer an essential part of a deed in many jurisdictions. So in many, check your jurisdiction. Where the estate is clearly defined in the granting clause of the premises, there is no necessity for a habendum. So when it's clear, you don't need that habendum, which are really the conditions. So it looks like this is a uh, habendum. Yes, sir. That's it. So this is really the conditions and not required so much, uh, although it really can't hurt to have some of this language in there. Again, 
It's not essential any longer in many jurisdictions. Now, some jurisdictions, you may require a necessity for that. Um, again, that's the whole purpose of American jurisprudence is to know what to look for. This way, you've really left nothing uncovered. If you are against a counterpart in a legal situation, you'll know there's going to be very little, if any, unexpected twists and turns. And guaranteed that most Esquires don't spend this much time as we're doing tonight to really dig deep into American jurisprudence and understand the intent and the beauty of, of the style of law that's really been a progression of, of like-minded people that want to expand personal liberties for everyone. Uh, let's see. So we're leaving off here on redendum, reservations, and exceptions. Because this part now we're going to get a little bit more detailed. We've been here for two hours and I think it's, uh, I'd like everyone to try to retain what we've learned so far because we've learned a lot today, I think, on deeds. So what I want to do is get back to the, uh, the outro set up here so that we can see that uh, what we learned tonight is what the deeds are. They are the instruments to making that voluntary transfer of real estate, of land, by title. And we've learned that the language although it must be clear, is not required to be formal in any particular way, as long as the intent is clearly communicated. So the legalese doesn't matter as much as the intent, and the proper wording does help. We also learned uh, some of the most powerful ways of owning property by a fee simple. So the fee simple absolute and although these terms don't need to be mentioned, again, in the deeds, they can only help in a reading of them so that your case will be rock solid should you ever have to be in a position where there could be a counterpart that's uh, contesting your claims. I guess on that note, uh, yeah, a little bit of learning through osmosis here, but let me tell you what, uh, a lot of what happens here with me, and I hope it happens for a lot of you, is a lot of this is subconscious learning, that we're learning a lot of this uh, intuitively in a way that when it does become important for us, our mind will quickly remember this. It kind of sits there in the back of our mind until we need it. Um, and I believe that this kind of stuff is very important for us to know, and it's a way of us preserving the uh, tradition of American jurisprudence that many have fought for us. Yeah, lawfulies versus legalese. I like that. Hey, man, that's, that's the, uh, the quote of the day. So, Again, you know, the big thing about this is that these are our courts. This is the people's courts. All of them are ours. And, and the people that are operating in them are administrating our property. And we are the beneficiaries of, of our courts. And the judges and the people that are in there, the officers and everyone else are mere administrators or trustees of the people's trust. That we are the beneficiaries, and we need to make claim to what we have owned. Otherwise, it's going to be sold out to the, the bar, and we're going to lose everything in one generation. And there'll be few people doing what we're doing here tonight. So uh, I salute you all for helping to keep it alive and keep this, uh, this tradition going. And I believe that if we continue to do this and spread this type of, <laughs> as long as we continue to do this, and exercise this knowledge, other people will see us doing it and want to do the same, and that will help engage people in perpetuating our beautiful style of American jurisprudence. On that, I want to thank you all for coming. Oh, man, it was uh, great great to have you here, uh, Delete Laws. I really appreciate it. i got to say, you've been in a, a big experience. Uh, a big inspiration for me to do this whole uh, experiment here of digging deep into American jurisprudence. And I appreciate everyone here that stuck around with me for this to learn. And I think we all have, have learned a lot because I know I have. And again, we'll be going back into the deeds again for part two, and we're going to get more into the, the nuances. But now I think everyone has a very fundamental understanding what deeds are. And now we can start to build on this knowledge with trusts and titles and other things to help us enjoy the benefits of the private property that America has been built for us to enjoy as the people. So here we go, guys. I want everyone to please hit the light and uh, subscribe. Hit the bell notification so you get notified next time we do this. And I'm trying to do this on a regular basis so we can continue the learning process and continue 
the fight. So, guys, I want to thank you all again for coming. Hey, we got Audit Them still in the house, too. I think we're going to be moving on with this. I also have an adverse uh, possession that we're going to go over, and that builds on what we learned tonight. So, again, this is a really good uh, – a good session for us to all attend so that it helps build on some really cool stuff we'll learn. Adverse possession is you have rights, cops have duties, said um, uh, it, it might come in to be very beneficial for us, and he seems to have been uh, enjoying it too, so that's why I like to, to help out those of us who have been helping you know, further our, our personal liberties. Again, salute to you all. I want to thank you all for coming, and until the next one, I'll see you then. Peace out.